London, and I'm Julie Elms from Strasbourg University. So we will talk to you about the patient who bleeds, but who really needs anticoagulation. And we will try to illustrate it with a um, clinical case, a short clinical case. Uh, we have a woman who is 38 years old. He, she is obese. She has no other medical uh, history. She has uh, called the local pre-hospital emergency service because of acute dyspnea. When they arrive, uh, she is, they found the patient cyanotic in cardiac arrest. The patient is intubated, and she returned to a sinus rhythm after six minutes of CPR. Uh, during transport to hospital, she presents a second cardiac arrest. So the shock team is uh, contacted. Sorry, the shock team is contacted, and the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism is um, suspected. When she arrives at hospital, she is placed under venoarterial ECMO. So, what would be um, your reperfusion therapy in acute high-risk pulmonary embolism like in this patient? What would you do? You have just admitted the patient in your ICU. She's under ECMO. What are you doing? Have you got a diagnosis? We suspect the, the diagnosis scanner. of pulmonary yeah. embolism, but we have not the proof of it but probably you will make uh, ultrason, cardi uh, ultrasonography uh, when she arrives. You will probably find acute gall pulmonale. So you have quite strong evidence of pulmonary embolism. Uh, and you can also look in the legs as well if you have got the skills because uh, if you look at massive pulmonary embolism, about a third of the patients will have residual clot in their legs. So that's also really helpful uh, in finding uh, the diagnosis. I, th I think in this case, my option, it will be thrombectomy. Surgical thrombectomy? Surgical thrombectomy? Uh, no, percutanea. Percutanea. Catheter guided. Okay, do you all agree? We indeed have several options for reperfusion therapy. No one will, will make a thrombolysis to this patient? We don't always have the, we can always do thrombectomy, so we would do thrombolysis in the acute phase. So I think most people would start if they could. I would with also do a thrombolysis. Yep. Uh, and the question is what dose of TPA you'd go for. Uh, you try and go if you're using systemic for 100 milligrams. Um, and if you were a little bit sure, you could give 50 and maybe another 50 after that to see if you could get any improvement. Um, the issue in Europe, but not in America over the last six months has been the shortage of tissue plasminogen activator. Uh, and I don't know who's been affected by it. In the UK, they said no TPA for anything except stroke. And we had to beg them. We said, this is a medical emergency. We have to use it in massive PE. But in intermediate PE, we have been using urokinase, and for all the other indications that we are using urokinase. Is that true for many of you, you here? You've been using urokinase, and urokinase comes in little tiny ampules, and for a massive PE, you'd have to draw up 80 ampules. So that's not fast treatment. There's a question. Can you use tenecteplase? Tenecteplase. Can you use tenecteplase? Um, so you can. Uh, we tend to use alterplase. Uh, tenecteplase has got a si slightly different strength to it, so uh, we tend to use alterplase. We have a, s a second option, which is surgical embolectomy. Why don't you choose it in a patient uh, who is on, uh, on ECMO? She has an increased bleeding risk, so if we uh, thrombolize this patient, she will probably bleed. Um, surgical embolectomy might be a good option. What do you think of it? So not everybody has got willing cardiac surgeons. Yes, it's, it's my example. I don't 
don't have it in my hospital. I don't have it. No, no cardiac surgery. Uh, yeah, probably throughout the surgery we can switch from peripheral venous ECMO to central venous ECMO, uh, venous arterial ECMO, if it's an option. Okay, Indeed, so it's an option, but we need to have cardiac surgery to do surgery. Yeah, it's an option. And the third option is uh, catheter di directed thrombolysis or embolectomy. But here we cannot always do it uh, in every hospital. In my hospital, for example, we cannot do it. Um, and we have just been comparing stories. We had a 21 year old transferred to us with a massive PE, went on ECMO, and we have really good intervention radiology. So we started off the TPA and then mechanically removed as much clot as possible. Um, it's really helpful to have a CTPA beforehand because it, the mechanical thrombectomy is well suited to big lumps of clot. Whereas if you have got a lot of peripheral clot, uh, it's not so effective. And so this girl has done very well and recovered uh, and, and gone home. So I just want to draw your attention on rec recent uh, reviews that has been published in ICM that just summarize uh, all the recommendations about um, the management of high-risk pulmonary embolism. So that's the points we have just discussed. Maybe we can go to the, um, to the following of the case. On day two, um, our patient has gastrointestinal bleeding uh, but also bleeding at site of cannula. She received uh, fluids, she received transfusion. So what is your transfusion strategy in a patient who is bleeding on ECMO? What would you do? So I would um, get um, Rotem or thromboelastogram uh, targeted um, transfusion management and assess um, the prothrombin time um, and see where, 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 which blood product would be more appropriate. Thanks. We will answer to this question later. How will you monitor your, your hemostasis profile? But what will you give to your patients among all the products we have listed here? It depends on findings, uh, so we can easily put it some one thing or maybe some complex or factor 13, it depends. If there is a gastrointestinal bleeding, I would probably start with a, a endoscopy, a gastrointestinal um, endoscopy and see if um, it, something can be done. I would call the surgeons if they can s s make some sutures at the site of the insertion of the cannula, so the, the, and then I will think about what products I should give. That's very complicated indeed. Yes, but the nurse says that uh, the, patient, the patient is hypotensive and the laboratory calls to tell that she has 6.0 6 uh, gram per deciliter of hemoglobin. So we cannot really wait. So I would start giving blood, erythrocytes, and um, yeah, probably, pro I think I would go with plasma and not the, the proton being complex concentrates. I think they are more thrombogenic on the on the ECMO th circuit than, than the normal plasma. The plasma contains everything. Um, yeah, I think I would go with, with plasma. Well, she is volume depleted, so giving and also plasma volume depleted. would be helpful. It would be really helpful to do a coag screen and a full blood count and have those available to help guide yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. What about fibrinogen concentrates? No, it depends on your class fibrinogen level, doesn't it? So if it's going to be low, uh, if it's less than 1.5, one would give either fibrinogen or cryoprecipitate. Um, and it really depends what you have available in your unit. Uh, I think the evidence suggests they're very similar. So for the moment, anyway. 
And don't you give platelets to these patients? Absolutely. Well, how much are you going to give? Hmm. How much do are you going to give to this patient? Shall we say her platelet count is 50? I think One. we all get platelets in different forms, don't we? How do you yes, get platelets in France? We have platelets in... Uh, we um, order platelets according to the, uh, to the platelet count. Yep. So we have um, uh, 10,000 platelets per, uh, per pack. So are you getting packs which come from one donor? No, we don't. Because in the UK we get pooled platelets, so we take the platelets it's from the same. six uh, same thing. patients. Okay. So, uh, so how much would you like to give? I would give her uh, 10 units per platelet. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I'd just give her a pool, so which should raise we, the platelet count by about 50 in a 70 kilogram adult. We have just recalled here. Uh, Uh, just to clarify, did you thrombolize the patient or not? It wasn't clear to me. And did you anticoagulate afterwards or not? I think it depends on your hospital. If you are in a hospital where you have no cardiac surgery and no, no possibility to make embolectomy, local thrombolysis or embolectomy, you will probably do a systemic thrombolysis. The question is half dose or full dose. If you have access to cardiac surgery, I would personally prefer to give to to send the patients to the operating room to have an, a surgical embolectomy. And if you have the possibility, but it's not our case, uh, for example, in Strasbourg, uh, if you have the possibility to make a local embolectomy or local thrombolysis, I would do this. So we would give. And of course, we and will we keep an, the patient next. We keep an eye on fibrinogen levels during lysis because lysis will break down fibrin. If you can't find the fibrin, it can't work on the fibrin, it will break down fibrinogen. Yeah. So you need to check fibrinogen levels regularly during thrombolysis. And if you run into real horrid bleeding problems, you can all get, always give tranosamic acid. And here we have put the algorithm of, um, of clinically important bleeding patients and what we should do in clinically important, uh, in clinically important bleeding. But you can see that this is the, the general algorithm. Uh, maybe it doesn't apply to our patients because, for example, would you give tranexamic acid to this patient? Uh, I wouldn't because uh, it increased the risk of uh, traumatic events. Some other ideas? Our expert. Sorry, what, what was the question? Tranexamic acid, do we give it? Um, try not to. So it's going to switch off all your fibrinolysis and you want endogenous fibrinolysis to eventually break down the remnants of the clot. So you keep away from it unless you are in big trouble and you need to stop bleeding. And independently of uh, patients on ECMO, it is not recommended in, bleeding in gastrointestinal bleeding according to the Euro European recommendation. Mm. So if we look at the trial for the use of tranosamic acid in GI bleeding, they actually gave a big dose. So they gave four grams over 24 hours after the patients had been admitted. And so we're dealing with people who have melina and who've, pro who've probably started bleeding 12 hours ago, whereas we can pinpoint this bleeding, can't we? We know when it started. Uh, and also giving TXA over 24 hours doesn't seem to be a good idea, whereas short TXA, as in crash two and trauma, is a better idea. So you could still use it. We don't really want to use it because it'll hang around a bit and stabilize the clots. Okay. So how will you monitor hemostasis in this patient and how will you guide your transfusion strategy? 
you have plenty of possibility. Which one will you choose? What about going to our thromboelastography expert? Can we ask them what, what you're monitoring? Are you doing FibTem and what, what, what parameters are you looking at? Yeah, I would, we actually use both in our ah. units. Yeah. <laughs> So there we have it. Um, so if we look at the comparison of thromboelastography and conventional screening, no one's done it really in intensive care, but it's been done, big, big trial in trauma, and the outcome of the patient, the numbers that died or got well was exactly the same in both groups. And I think that the message is monitor, 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 just pick the method that you're happy with. If you're super expert in thromboelastography, please use it. But otherwise, conventional testing is fine. And you just need to check that your lab can get you back the results of the tests when they're being done. Um, what will your be your anticoagulation strategy in this patient? She's on ECMO and she's bleeding. What will you do? I'm helping you with some proposal. Sorry, can I go back to your last um, question about uh, monitoring? Um, so if you, use, um, if you don't have viscoelastic assay, how, how do your lab monitor fibrinolysis state? Um, we don't, do we? So you could ask for a regular D-dimer, but it's always telling you what's happened 24 hours ago. And then this lady will have enormously high D-dimers because she's had massive PE. Um, and then you, are, I think, are overestimating how good thromboelastography is at picking up fibrinolysis. Yes, it does pick it up, but you really have to have severe hyperfibrinolysis and it doesn't pick up everybody. So uh, it's exciting to see it, but it's not always reproducible and it will miss some of those with hyperfibrinolysis, which is why you should always give TXA in trauma and not wait for a TEG. So what about anticoagulation in this patient? She has a pulmonary embolism and an ECMO. We have to anticoagulate her. What will you do? I think we're using unfractionated heparin, aren't we all? Is anyone using orgatroban in ECMO? Such a lovely drug, but far too expensive. So we're all using unfractionated heparin. So Julie, how would you run the unfractionated heparin mm. for this lady before she bled, of course? Before she bled, um, I would use in, indeed an uh, unfractionated heparin at therapeutic level, targeting an anti a level of 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 uh, units. But when she is bleeding, I would stop anticoagulation until the bleeding is, is um, controlled. But the question is, when can we restart the anticoagulation in this patient? Because gastrointestinal bleeding is quite difficult to monitor. We will not be sure that she is not still bleeding. Um, bleeding on cannula is more easy to, um, to, to see. You, you'll stop it completely therapeutic and you wouldn't have anything else? Okay. I would indeed stop completely uh, anticoagulation. A ECMO at full, um, at full baby uh, do not require anticoagulation for a few hours. You can stop heparin for some hours, for one day, two days, sometimes. Uh, you have s several papers that have shown that uh, you can manage um, an a patient on an ECMO without any anticoagulation and without a very increased thrombotic risk. So it's only when patients have a um, complete contraindication to anticoagulation when you have no choice. Okay. But we don't want to do that forever, do we? And we have to think about a vena cava filter. And the, ugh, I hate vena cava filters, but sometimes you have to use them. And if this lady 
has had an ultrasound of her legs. We've definitely got residual thrombus there. I'd want to put a vena cava filter in. I know you can get temporary ones. Uh, if we had to use one of the conventional ones, I'd pop it in and then we would fix the date to take it out 10 days time uh, to make sure that it comes out because long standing vena cava filters uh, are, are not much fun. And would you use mechanical prophylaxis? So this is what we were discussing before. This is... I have a problem um, imagining how to use the filter when the patient had a, a VA ECMO. Or uh, where do you put it? The, f the, the, the filter, the, the cover filter. <laughs> Below the, okay. So, is around the cannulas somehow? Yeah. Okay. I haven't seen one in someone on ECMO. Has anyone? Have you? Never no? on ECMO. No. Okay. So technically difficult one. Okay. So who uses graduated compression stockings? Are they? Do you go on your wards and everyone's got white legs with stockings on? Yes. Because at us in the UK, we're on a mission to prove to you that stockings have no effect at all. So we've just done a study called the GAP study and we randomized 3,000 moderate risk surgical patients, moderate VT risk, to stocking versus no stocking, and they all got low molecular weight heparin. Surprisingly, there was no benefit at all from the stockings. Our National Institute of Health Research have just given us three million to look at low-risk surgical patients, and so we're cluster randomizing 20,000 low-risk surgical patients to stocking versus no stocking, because we believe they have virtually no benefit. And if you look at studies, the CLOT studies in stroke patients, they put high-risk stroke patients with a very immobile leg to stocking versus no stocking. They looked at the rates of DVT and VTE uh, at 90 days, no difference between them. But those who wore the stockings had a high risk of so side effects such as skin breaks and one had an amputation. So stockings are not what they should be. I know we're used to using them, but the evidence base is just developing. So I wouldn't be using stockings, but I love intermittent pneumatic compression. Now I know that the trial uh, of pneumatic compression in uh, intensive care patients showed little benefit, but outside of that trial, they are enormously benefit. So in the Patients who had stroke, after they showed there was no benefit from stockings, they did a trial of intermittent pneumatic compression, and they significantly reduced the risk of pulmonary emboli, and it was nearly statistically significant that the patients at six months had a higher life survival rate if they got intermittent pneumatic compression. So... It works, and there's a lot of trials in surgery. So I would be using intermittent pneumatic compression, but not on the leg with the clot in, because it's asking for it to be moved on again, and you will be back to where we started from. So does anyone use intermittent pneumatic compression? I know it's not particularly favored in intensive care, but it's got, that's just a waste of money. We spend 63 million in the UK on stockings every year, and we're on a mission to stop the spending of that money. And just a comment back to the vena, vena cava filter. I think it's, in fact, I didn't understand your question before. I think it's possible only if you have a jugular cannula, then you can put your, your filter, but not if you have femoral cannula. I think we cannot put a vena cava filter in this case.
Can you do Fawa ECMO, jugular and and uh, uh, femoral? Femi okay. Um, yes. Yeah, we only do femoral, femoral this U second. Usually that's what we yeah. do, but sometimes they also put it. So. Um, I have a question. Our patient is at day three on ECMO, and she has these lab results. She has an APTT above 150 seconds. She has an antifactor TNA that cannot be measured, and the other parameters that you can see. What will you do? I don't think this is easy. It's very postgraduate, isn't it? Um, so I did ask why did, oh, you, you've taken it off. Okay, so it's not there. Um, Okay, so uh, what does, thank you. I would start giving, at, I would definitely give antithrombin. It's too, too low. The level should be around 70%, yep. more than 70. Yep, but how would you give it? Because you look like you've got other things going on here. You've probably got some deficiency of some factors as well. So you could give your lovely expensive antithrombin <laughs> concentrate, costs 50p a unit. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you're probably going to spend 3,000 pounds or 3,000 euros. Or what else could you do? Good old fashioned medicine. FFP. FFP. Uh, one, yeah. Yes, Plasma. because there's probably multiple deficiencies yeah, yeah. of coagulation factors, aren't there? Uh, and so, because she, she bled yeah. out and probably they didn't quite keep up. Her fibrinogen is normal mm -hmm. because she's probably having an acute phase response. It's very much an acute phase protein, so it'll come up. But all the other coagulation factors are probably quite low. And they're probably around the same level as the antithrombin because she, she bled out. Does she have any liver hypoperfusion? Yes, she has. And she has a factor five that is uh, 30%. Yeah. So what's so interesting about factor five? Does anyone? So if, uh, if you look at fibrinolysis, uh, the plasmin loves fibrin. It loves fibrinogen. If it can't find those, it'll go for factor five and factor eight. So somebody who's had a lot of fibrinolysis going on will have a particularly lower level of factor five. And what about thrombolysis on factor five? Oh, it drops, yeah, okay. but not to the levels that we particularly worry about. We've got a minute left. Does anyone have some questions? So how much FFP is enough to correct the antithrombin at the low antithrombin level? What do you normally give when you give FFP? What's your recipe? Four. We just empirically give four. You give four. Okay. So you're not doing 50 mils per kilogram or anything like that? Or your patients must be all of a reasonable size, yes, are they? about 60 kilos. Yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds about right, doesn't it? I think we might need to use more in the UK. I would give 10, 12 to 15 milliliters per kilo. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, as the time is over, I just uh, remind you that we have published recommendation with the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis on uh, guidelines on anticoagulation for patients on ECMO, but of course not patients on ECMO who are bleeding. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you.